find a tool to help you be consistent. For me, it's it's a calendar. I mean, it can be a calendar for, I think, most people. Um, and then use it. Use it religiously. Put everything in there. Just get so habitual that your calendar is like your Bible, and you'd be so surprised at what you can accomplish. I mean, it's just crazy what you can accomplish if you manage your time like you're always analyzing it and you're always trying to make it more efficient. So with those types of things, with a business, you can really see big returns because with a business, you make a 10% improvement on something. I mean, God, you're moving the bottom line. That could be the difference between profit and loss. Welcome to the Big Deal Real Estate Podcast, where we talk about things pertaining to Vancouver real estate, its suburbs, and business in general. We also like to bring on people who are kind of a big deal from time to time. I am your co-host, That Agent Kelly here at Jerry AK, that guy that does mortgages. If you're watching this on YouTube, leave us a comment, a like, subscribe to the channel. We're pushing 1,600 subs right now. And... Um, Appreciate you guys who've been leaving ratings on the uh, Spotify because I think we're at like nearly 40 ratings on there, which is, I've looked at other podcasts and that's a lot of ratings. We're doing pretty good on there. So appreciate you guys. Our guest today, the aforementioned big deal, <laughs> Corbin Chivers. Wow. Thanks, Thanks for, for the uh, introduction. Oh. Appreciate it, boys. Of it's, course, uh, man. Big so, pleasure to be here. Oh, Finally. Well, the pleasure's all ours. So uh, tell us about Corbin. Oh, that's a big, long, ambiguous question. Uh, Let me well, well, from, the be- sure. from the beginning. Yeah. From the beginning. Well, when I was a, a wee lad, well, <laughs> where would you like me to start? <laughs> um, be- before real estate. How before long, real estate? Before you got in real estate. So uh, immediately before I was in real estate, I was in the health and fitness industry. So I'd worked at Fitness Unlimited and Fitness World. And I worked in that industry for 10 years. So I was uh, gym membership sales, personal trainer, and then I became uh, general manager. So that's kind of where I was coming from before I started into real estate. Um, so that was 2005 to 2014. Okay, so like the whole online personal trainer thing wasn't really around yet at that time. Ooh, that's a great question. No, it was just sort of evolving. Like there's certainly people that were training online, but for the most part, it was um, in person. That was where it mainly where it was at. And I was at a big health club. So we were selling in-person training. We were selling meal plans, things like that. So yeah, we had a really cool um, setup at Fitness World. And that was like a really highly driven sales environment. So if anything, that was probably like the precursor to get into real estate was, yeah. was that for sure. Do you, do you think if online like personal training was around at that time, you would have went that route? Some people kill it doing that. It's unbelievably scalable. scalable these days. Oh yeah. You know what? That's where a lot of the top trainers who from those big health clubs are gone. They've totally gone that route. So for me, I was only a trainer for uh, some time and then I mostly did management and then sales. Um, but I was certified as a trainer and I saw how the trainers work. So <laughs> You know, the biggest income earners now are people that usually have an online uh, coaching sort of like scalable, like you said, duplicatable, scalable business. They're emailing their clients um, and, you know, you're just modifying meal plans yeah. slightly, modifying workouts slightly, doing video training with multiple people. So, yeah, I mean, that totally changed the business big time. Yeah. T- typically, like with people that go into fitness, what I've noticed is like people go into the fitness industry because they're like passionate about f- working out. They're passionate about fitness. Yeah. Like, if you're passionate about fitness, why, what made you want to switch careers to real estate? Ah, uh, great question. Yeah, no, fitness fitness personally changed my life. I got involved into like working out with my dad when I was probably maybe 11 or 12. Um, I was quite weak actually in elementary school. So then my dad got me into the gym, which actually totally built up my confidence. It got me into that. So the gym was very much um, a big part. Oh, sorry. Uh, the gym was very much a big part of like building my confidence and all that sort of stuff in terms of sales. And, and uh, I love the fitness aspect. But why I got into real estate was um, the company that purchased us, Fitness World, was an American company that was starting to tighten the screws on us. They were reducing our bonuses, changing our commission, um, just giving us all kinds of reasons to not want to work there anymore. So uh, I think it was like 2013, I started to pursue something else. And then my best friend and my partner now, Chris McGill, uh, he was a realtor and been a realtor for uh, longer than I had. So he had suggested that I take a look at real estate. He said, um, if you apply the same work ethic and, and uh, you know, everything, your, your, your passion towards fitness, towards real estate, uh, you'll enjoy it and, and you're helping people in a different way and you can, you know, totally work for yourself. And all that was seemingly like awesome to me at the time. So that was 
the start at the time (laughs) at the time well it seemed like my friend well yeah chris was basically and i what i thought not needing to work a lot of hours i was working a ton of hours so it seemed on the outside like maybe you know i could get away with not working as much but then i quickly realized that sure was not the case that's what it seems like for everyone looking in from the outside yeah and and i actually uh, full circle i actually work with chris today and he'll tell you that both him and i work more hours than we've ever worked (laughs) in our life now and he's been doing it for more than 10 years Wow. So, okay, you get into real estate 2013 and 2014, yeah. 2014. Yeah. I'm get how long before you started seeing real success in real estate? November 2015. Oh, so it only took like a year. Um, uh, like almost two. But what do you I classify guess. as real success? That's that's a Well, I mean it's it's subjective to everybody, but People Consistent have, flow of business. You know what I mean? Like people have like a number or whatever in their head where they, that's like. For success. me, it was a number that immediately, it was a monthly number that I'd earned that month from, from all the closings, from a really hard, like, you know, fall and, and end of the summer that made me realize, well, hey, if one month can be like that, I just did the math automatically times it by 12. I said, well, if my standards are now going to be this and I times that by 12, I mean, <laughs> that's possible. And that number was so far higher than any, it was like, you know, I just three and did a half that times. Exact same thing. Last yeah, month. You, yeah. You take your best month, and I think it's natural as an entrepreneur. You want to look up. You want to see things better than they are. So you have one good month, and and for me, it was November 2015 that things totally changed. But my first year where my life changed was 20 um, 2016, and that's when I basically uh, uh, worked by my worked not by myself, sorry, but worked a lot of business by myself that year and, and had a great year. But it was so different than my first six months, which was not fun. <laughs> Yeah. So what what were you doing that things changed? Like what what happened? Uh, well, my first six months, I was doing everything I possibly could because at, at the time when I worked at the gym, one thing that was nicely controlled for us was you had leads and people to call. But uh, the leads and people to call were generated from the company. They have a website that says click here for your one week membership. And I would say, hey, Connor, it's Corbin calling you from Steve Nash Fitness World today. Hey, I'm just calling about your one-week membership pass today. Guess what? You want a two-week membership pass plus a personal training session with Jarrett. And we get into why that's a great session and, and why you should you know, come by and try us out. And I had oodles of people to call. So all I had to really um, work at the job was working the calls. Like if you have the work ethic and you work at a company and you've got the leads, yeah. you just dominate. What I'm not generating anything. I mean, a robot just making more calls, developing my skill set. So yeah. with that, I was thinking the same would be true for real estate without any leads to call. I really didn't know what to do. So it was tough because I think the first people we tried calling were expired listings. I don't know if you guys have ever called expired listings. Yeah. So as a new agent, like what are you offering that the previous senior agent to you didn't offer? Why would they ever want to work with you over the person that they didn't sell their house with? Who's probably sold 10 times more homes than you have. So that was like the first batch of leads that I felt kind of like, well, that's not very easy. Yeah. <laughs> um, so he asked me, the question was, well, it worked. That's what didn't work. Um, and then what sort of really gained traction was just after a certain period of time, I think through um, being really, really overt in every piece of marketing I could be, so, namely social media. Um, so uh, times of the day were different than, you know, with yourself now and with everything you're doing social media. Um, you know, there wasn't quite as much competition, I would say. It wasn't so innovative, right? Like if you were posting on social media consistently, consistently, um, you know, that was seen as like, wow, like no one's doing it consistently. That was very low bar back yeah, then. Right. So I just, I just started to do things like post every single day, uh, make an effort to share more about my work days uh, on my social media, like on Instagram, sharing what I'm doing, that I'm in showings, that I'm at an open house, and just really making it so my my old persona online really had a lot of people see me in fitness because I worked at the gym for yeah. 10 years. Um, and I realized that power could be amplified, or not amplified, sorry, transition from getting messages about supplements and gym memberships every single day to probably real estate. Um, so I did everything from change my profile picture to my um, headshot, like everybody does now, obviously. Um, you know, go into social media community pages, start posting like crazy, systematically, with intention, in a calendar, every single day, never skipping. Um, adding new people to all my social media accounts. So um, no TikTok. It was just uh, Facebook and Instagram. And Instagram, Instagram was like young. Back Instagram then. was young for sure. Yeah, it wasn't as big. And Facebook was really where we put most of our advertising dollars. I don't, I don't even know if we advertised on Instagram or if you could back then. 
But um, we really started to just notice that with social media, like I would post a soul picture, I would post a coming soon picture. We would look at ways to just have more content per uh, per activity and just really get ourselves out there. So I think doing that over time and being consistent um, and having success at the job, right? Just having really good results for people and actually be able to share the results by sharing all those soul pictures and all the all the happy clients. I think that just snowballed. Were you ever big into like online lead gen, like like with uh, paid ads and stuff? Great, no. qu- great question. I just cut every single source of paid lead that we have as of yesterday. <laughs> I just did an audit for this year. Everyone? I, every every. So like you got so. Yelp too? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if we had Yelp, I'd cancel that. I would be so quick to freaking slash them or anybody. Um, you know what? There's huge merit in online leads in my belief. And I, I don't poo-poo online leads. There's great businesses. People do tremendous with online leads. I've met people that do 25 deals in a year in a brand new city and they met no one and they just landed off a plane. And they said, yeah, I took my suitcase out and I started working XYZ company leads and, and they made a good go of it. So I like online leads because you can control um, the effort. You can control what you do, how often you call. And those are things you can coach for and train for. So they're scalable. Um, but for us, we've built more. Um, other, we've had other sources of leads. So the reason why is that we canceled them so quick is because I mean, I, I could tell you how much we spent. You, you, your eyes would roll back in your head how much we spent on online leads from January to now. So I did a full audit just this past Sunday. I spent five hours just like OCD mode, went in every single category of expense. And I realized that if those leads aren't treated like best practice, I mean like speed to lead quickly, great follow-up campaign, like a drip campaign, pr- aggressive agents who are on a script, who know what they're doing, who are calling systematically, they're probably garbage leads in my opinion. If you're if you're just like paying for these expensive price for leads, we're paying, well, per lead, anywhere from 20 to $50 per lead. Wow. wow. And that's through, I guess, Google for that. That was through Facebook, actually. Really? Wow, yeah. that's crazy. It used to be much more affordable, but our ads, you know, uh, over time probably need to be more innovative or something. I mean, they're great ads and they produce great and we've actually done business from them for sure. But yeah, we don't do a lot of online stuff right now like that. Not really. So mainly just referral, past client referral business partners, all that kind of stuff. Uh, right? Google is huge for us. We oh. rank, we rank really well in Google. We're number one in, in um, number one in Langley and, and top three for many other local sub areas. And, and that's a lot of it's organic SEO stuff because we get like a lot of reviews and a lot of local posts, a lot of local business placements. Like we'll do soul pictures and we'll do them every single client in the area, tag them on Google as well. And then if you go to our profile, you can see there's like 280 soul pictures with real people with reviews, 150 reviews. So, I mean, it has a lot of credibility. Now it's over the, I think the age, the business placements over like eight years or seven years. So oh, yeah, you get that yeah. extra boost. Or Credibility. Yeah. So I think, you know, we do a lot of business from that. We're really, really good on our speed to get um, back to anyone from Google. So people search listings usually by, um, you know, agent, like top agent, best agent, you know, people yeah. search by buying something by location. So we have keywords for both and our website does this pretty well. So that generates a lot, but really uh, repeat clients, referrals, um, personal sphere, all those stuff. Those yeah. are our biggest drivers for sure. Wow. By far. Hmm. And then the crazy branding where you do the, the beers and all that stuff. Well, we do a lot of stuff. I mean, we're on about 25 uh, you know, bus benches. We're, yeah. we're slashing some of those too. Uh, we're I, was on, just about, I wanted to ask you about those bus well, benches. Well, that, 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 that was the last category that was immune to my slashiness, except for Sunday. Then I had to, because had to, you know, back in the day, you'd have to wait for like a year to get a spot on your street. You're just every week you'd email and the bigger agent would have it automatically, right? You just, so to give those up, it's, you know, it's a sunk cost bias. It's all kinds of bias when you don't give those up. But I mean, yeah, they all got slashed. So, um, yeah, all we've, of them. Um, a little bit, not okay. yeah, just a little bit, like 25%. <clears throat> Nothing drastic. How many are there More total incremental. right now? Um, I think we have about roughly well, we have about 20 bus benches and about, uh, we had like, I think 12 or 15 bus shelters, wow. billboards, run the TVs at the gyms. Those do, those are, I'm at yeah. the gym and I'm there all the time. So I see myself there all the time and people know me from working there for 10 years. So yeah. it's kind of a good market. <laughs> Pardon the interruption, guys. This podcast is sponsored by Stonehouse Realty. Stonehouse Realty has one-on-one coaching with top producers every Friday. We have training at least three times a week. If you look at the January training schedule as of 2023, it's crazy. There's like two trainings a day every day. So if you're a new agent looking to make a change or anybody looking to get their real estate license, you can reach right out to us, schedule an appointment, and we'll get you in. Stonehouse Realty, experience the difference. What I want to know is, do you feel like the bus benches have been a good investment? Absolutely. Yeah? 100%. Can you elaborate? No. 
<laughs> sure I can. Yeah. No, I would say this. Um, where do, they, do people call you and say, hey, I saw you on a bus bench? No. Not really. That doesn't happen as much as you may think. What does happen, though, is that you get you work your ass off for a long time in a certain area and your signs are everywhere and your listings are everywhere and your other marketing is everywhere and your social media is everywhere. And people kind of understand and, and, and acknowledge like, well, okay, if your signs are everywhere, you've mm-hmm. got this credibility. Just It yeah. just establishes what, like, we have the credibility with just our business. So when I first started, it was to help establish that. Now it's to just help maintain that, right? Yeah. We, we want to make sure the area that we, the areas that we work in have our presence and people know that we work a ton in that area, which we do. Um, and it adds like any appointment that we go to, you know, we know they've likely, if they're in those areas, have seen, seen us. You. Yeah, they've seen us. Maybe watch our videos. Maybe maybe watch, seen something online. Plus, they've seen that. Plus, they drive by it all the time. Or plus, they see me and my car that's wrapped and me on the TV at the mm-hmm. gym every day. So it's a lot of you're seeing my face of multiple times. <laughs> that's, no, no that's introduction part of the magic. needed. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just figured there's a there's a pretty like tried and true tactic with any strategy of marketing for hundreds of years. The more places you put your face, the better. I mean, with maybe d- different returns everywhere you do it, but if you go hard and you know that as a basic foundational principle, you get more famous by putting your, not famous, I should say, but get more, you know, notoriety in your, in your profession. It pretty much is like more, being, it's star power. Yeah. It's, I get, it I get, well, yeah, I guess, and I guess it's credibility, right? You want more people to, to be introduced to you in your business. So you can pr- service more people. So yeah, we want to grow the business. I mean, I don't like make any qualms about that. We want to grow fast. So we market pretty hard. Um, and the signage works. Yeah. Yeah. So are you still working with buyers then? I know you were talking about like buyer keywords. Um, yeah, well, personally, I'm not personally on the buyer side, but my team, which is I have an awesome team of three other agents. So I've got my best friend, Chris McGill on the team. Um, I've got Deborah on the team and I've got Melanie on the team. They're three other agents and they work with all the buyers. They're fantastic. So we have like a buyer concierge program for every buyer. Um, you know, they get matched up with myself, with another buyer's agent and with one of our assistants, our client care managers. And um, yeah, we pay for some buyer leads where we were paying for some buyer leads and we have the buyer keyword search. So we want those leads because, you know, people search um, often to buy before they sell as well. Yeah. Right? right. So we want to get both of that. Hmm. So what, 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 what would you say your best year has been just so because I know you've put up numbers, right? But just so the list, are, are you are you willing to disclose what the best year has been? Not maybe in like dollar amount. Sure, but yeah. It was, well, I mean, it, it's pretty it's pretty much any agent you ask. If they didn't say 2021, then they're very different than the rest of the market. I mean, it was 2021 by far. I mean, vo- volume of transactions per month was insane. So, I, I, yeah, I sold 121 with my team in 2021. That That's was a great crazy. year. And last year was 79. And and this year, well, we'll see. I'll, 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 uh, I'll know soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How are you feeling about the market this year in comparison to last? Well, it's really tough. I mean, there's no question about it. I mean, there's, there's some definite recent um, wins to be had for sellers that are trying to sell that weren't able to sell in the fall because of the low sales ratio. Then they were able to sell as, as sales picked up when listings stayed record low. Um, I mean, I like what you do in your, a lot of your uh, stats, and I see you both do this a lot and, and dive into the stats. I mean, I think September to January, in the Fraser Valley at least, it was the uh, monthly lowest record for that respective month for listings right the way through until February hit. It was crazy. It was crazy. Yeah. And then listings now in the Fraser Valley, I don't have June stats, but I know you pulled those up. I think it was the fourth lowest or third lowest with 2017 being the second lowest oh, and wow. 2006 being the first lowest for listings. <laughs> so when people ask how the market's doing well from an inventory standpoint, and you guys hear this all the time too, I mean, it's still low inventory. Um, from a sales volume standpoint, we, we identified that it was the 10th lowest sales month out of 18 months. So right in the middle of the pack for the month of May. So, I mean, if sales are, are normalized or averaged in the last uh, 18 years and the um, listings are low, that's why prices were going up. But then I just saw, like you pointed out uh, uh, well, well said in your video today, that prices have started to fall in many areas now. Yeah. I, th- I was telling Connor like a couple of weeks ago, we got an email from... TD like on the broker channel and that's probably like one of the main lenders brokers use because as brokers we have access to just a few of the major banks not all of them some of the major banks like RBC CIBC don't have broker channels they don't allow mortgage brokers to use them so TD is kind of the main one because they they're good with rates we got an email from them and they said this year gross commissions given to brokers because that's who pays our like pays us our commission is down 60 percent from last year Whew. And that's probably wow. the biggest lender amongst every single broker. If you ask any mortgage broker, 
what bank they use the most, they're likely going to say TD is their, is their most. And they, they told us amongst all their brokers, down 60% from last year. That's astounding. 60%. 60% from less. From 2022. Not, they've been paying out 60% less commissions than last year. So there's a couple of things. That there's obviously less deals happening, but also the change in terms. So we get paid less on shorter terms, like two years and three years versus like a five-year term. Oh. So in, in oh. 2021, 2020, and start of 2022, there's a lot of five-year variables, like fixed rates still happening. And then all of this year has really been like two, three-year fixed rates. And it's like wow. instead of one one percent, it's like it's like point eight percent. So it's like so there's oh, like there's of, the, of the mortgage so there, amount. There, yeah, right? there's a cut. There's so a there's twenty percent there yeah. per deal, but then also there's wow. like yeah. another like forty <laughs> percent there or whatever. It's right? crazy. So it's, it's the commission per deal, the price per deal, and the number of deals. I guess. Yeah. yeah. Oh all yeah. Three. Yeah. Also the price per deal. So too. three three numbers working against all of us right now. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, so yeah, that's how I answer how the market's doing from that standpoint. But yeah. Do you th- other than like transaction like volume? Do you think that the market is just like generally tougher right now to actually get a deal done? Yeah, I would say we've got a much higher. Uh, we're seeing higher amount of deals fall apart. Like yeah. I think we're seeing maybe. I mean, in the in the 2021, I don't think we had any deals fall apart, really. I mean, no. nothing nothing happened that really fell apart on us. Surprising, considering everything was subject free. Everything yeah. was cash, right? But um, And then, you know, last year in the fall, we started to get some deals a little sticky with appraisals, things like that. And then I think starting um, just this year, we've noticed that, yeah, banks are, are not uh, proving buy. At least on the listing side, I can speak that a lot of the buyers that are coming in are not getting approved yeah. or they're asking for some weird condition. Everybody wants to have a date of closing that's in the next month, but a possession that's a couple months away because of their um, rate hold before yeah. the rates went up. So we're finding that's kind of interesting, but yeah, way more deals are falling apart than before. Yeah, there's a lot of weird stuff too. Like it's just, I don't know. It's like every listing I have takes like three tries right now to sell it. Like unless, <laughs> unless it's something I can put on like, um, an offer date, yeah. right? Then it's gone. But right. if it's if it's just something that you just you know you list, just, this is the price kind of thing, right? Um, it's yeah, it's taking me two or three tries a lot of the time, right? So yeah, yeah, we're we're finding that we're seeing that sort of thing happen too, where people counter off regardless of which side, and one party may not counter back. It's a little strange, you know. We see those types of things. We're we're trying to find some more innovative ways to sort of uh, structure our listing so we can kind of, you know hedge on the best tactic to, to yeah. be on, on balance because if you're if you're not measured and you're all in one direction with the DRPO, well, you could really shoot yourself in the foot as we've all seen. And if you um, you know don't have a scheduled something and you have the intersection of people seeing it all all the times of the day and, and one offer is one day and one offer is the next day, you, you see that happen too. And really the place should sell for over, but they just can't even get the people in the door at the same yeah. time. So I see both. We're yeah. trying to we're trying to do a bit of a blended approach. We're trying some new things. Hmm. That's awesome. Okay, so I got a question for you. How do you balance fitness and being a top one percent realtor? Well, luckily, fitness is like easy for me to balance because it's like in my DNA. It's all I want to do all the time. Like I'm gonna go for a run today. And I can't wait. It's exciting. Um, I worked at the gym because like fitness was second nature for me. I just love it. I mean, I'm not the fittest person, but I it's part of my lifestyle. So. Every day I do something, and uh, I got a big thing in my gym at home. It just says uh, uh, one hour is 4% of your day, so what are your excuses? Um, and when you think about it, it's one of those things that the the first order you know, effects of a workout, you feel good, or maybe some people feel bad. Okay, that's one thing, but the second effects of, okay, you, you put an hour in now, you could add 10, 15 years to your life and you're at, doing 4% of your day to do something. I mean, it's just, for me in my mind, it's like the trade-off just makes so much sense. Plus it's the only way I can manage uh, the, all the stresses of real estate. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how do you deal with all this stuff if you don't have an outlet, right? You need to yeah. have something. So you, so, you work out at, so you work out later in the day. You don't, you're not a morning workout. You know what? When morning. I wake up, I would love it if I could go for a run before I start because I know I'd feel better for it. But for some reason I wake up and my brain's like, you know, I just got to respond. I yeah. got to be, I feel like I, I have to get to my phone first or else I'll go on a run and one thing will turn to the next thing. And then I feel like my whole day will get away. So for me, I feel like I, the reward for me is the workout after I've like got to business, but I should do morning workouts though. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's I think we're, we're opposite with yeah. that. I work out, I work out the end of the day. 
He's like right in the morning, 4 a.m. Right in the morning. <laughs> oh, you're 4 a.m. Yeah, I got to do it right in the morning. Oh, you're psyched. Well, if you're up at four, I think you're not missing anything. That's on the, on that's the why I side. do it though, because I know the feeling you're talking about. If but, I'm at, if I'm at the gym at seven, yeah, my phone's going off the whole but, time. I but can't then focus on what I'm doing. You go to bed late. You go to bed early at like nine though. Yes. Like yeah. I, I can't do that. Sure. I have people messaging me until way later. You guys have like a twenty four seven podcast. You guys have opposite uh, schedules completely. <laughs> so you're up at four then. And four thirty. Wow. Yeah. Four thirty. I hit my burpees at four forty, which I just posted <laughs> on my Instagram story for the first day today. And then I'm in the gym by like five thirty. Well done. Yeah. Well done. Yeah. Impressive. But if I go like exactly what you're saying, if I go at seven. Then people are starting to text me and then I get anxiety and I'm like distracted because I know things right. are piling up on my phone yeah. and then I just can't do it. It has yeah. to be done right away. Yeah. And yeah. if you can ignore it, yeah, if you can do that and ignore it and not have it, anything come in, that's perfect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. So what do you think? I know the answer to this, but I want to see what you say. What do you think has made you successful? I would consider that you're pretty successful. I would say that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, well, I appreciate you saying that. I mean, what? things that I would attribute to having success. I would say, you know, cause I feel like we've had success, I've had success, but uh, always room for improvement and always looking for more. But I think consistency is like, is so cliche as it is. I mean, I think consistency of everything. I mean, consistency of work ethic. Like if you just factor in what it means to take one less day off a week, right? What's an extra eight hours times 50 weeks. That's 400 hours. More. What is that? I just did math on the spot. Could have been totally Eight wrong. Yeah. Talking to mortgage yeah, broker. I'm like, is that? Four. Yeah. So whatever the heck that number is. Um, I mean, that's how many hours could you apply that towards self-improvement, working on your business? Um, it's insane. Right. And then you start to factor in those little quarter pivot turns. Like, what does it mean to just like have all your meals delivered and not not leave the office? What does it mean to, you know, work a little bit extra and all those look like extra um, habitual things that are like consistent habitual things. I think that's like just like, I guess that's like the the machine, if you will. And then the tactics of actually what to do is just always being, you know, open minded. I think you have to just always look at it every day. Like, you know, it could be your you know last day of business, if you will. Like, I mean, we've I've always approached it fly circling my head whoops I smacked the mic um, <laughs> um, you know I approached it very um, aggressively when I first started because I came from a job that had guaranteed income and I had guaranteed high expenses when I came in the business so I felt that it was just like uh, apply all the same things at a company that you would if you're in like a you know a management position to run a big sales team at a gym or a store and apply that to real estate so I mean, there's lots of things I could point to but I'd say you know being consistent with all that and um and then being open-minded and, and, and adopting all kinds of new stuff as we go and mm. trying lots of stuff and not being afraid to fail um, and reinvesting money back in the business all the time and invest back in the business more than you pay yourself to start because if you want to build the machine, you really have to build a, a company and, and uh, have other people that you work with. I'm going to dig deeper into that. How come you, instead of, how come you above most people are consistent? Because it's easy to say, it's consistency, but how are you consistent? Well, I have a, I have I have OCD, so it's pretty easy to be consistent. I just pop it in my phone, and the to dos get to done, and it's pretty. I just operate like like to put it this way. I came here what last week thinking we had the <laughs> podcast because my calendar told me that we had the podcast because you didn't change the invite actually, and you <laughs> left sorry. it there. Yeah, it is chairs. And I, and I had to say that, I, had to, I saved that for the podcast. I'm sorry. <laughs> so you didn't change the invite. So my, my thought was we had a conversation, sure, a text message, but because it didn't register to the email, I was like, well, I don't know. I just follow my calendar. I must be wrong. Surely the conversation never happened. I questioned my own memory and just behaved as if I'm coming here because everything goes in my calendar. So to answer your question, how to be consistent, find a tool to help you be consistent. For me, it's it's a calendar. I mean, it can be a calendar for, I think, most people. Um, and then use it. Use it religiously. Put everything in there. Just get so habitual that your calendar is like your Bible, and you'd be so surprised at what you can accomplish. I mean, it's just crazy what you can accomplish if you manage your time like you're always analyzing it and you're always trying to make it more efficient. So with those types of things, with a business, you can really see big returns because with a business, you make a 10% improvement on something. I mean, God, you're moving the bottom line. That could be the difference between profit and loss. Yeah. Right? So. See, for me, it's like, when it comes to stuff like that, like calendar organization, I do it, but I have to like really force myself to do it. 
every single it's time. It's not a habit yet. It's not like a, it, it's, yeah, it's not like a habit yet for me. I still have to force myself to do all that stuff. Right. Well, whatever you do is working. So, I mean, there's a lot of that too, right? Like everyone's got their own way. And I, um, like I work with a partner that we work very different. We always say we're yin and yang to how we work too. My partner, Chris, um, and he'd say the same thing. And, you know, I'm more militantly religious with a calendar and, and, um, you know, he's maybe a little bit less and, and we find that that works great for him and whatever you're doing is working. But if you're trying to improve, I think anyone would improve with more organization than less. So yeah, I don't know. I mean, having notifications on your phone and having them go off and making sure you like find a way to force yourself to do it with like, you know, like anything else, I think you condition yourself just like any other habit you've ever done. Some conditions are, or conditioning is easier than others. Hmm. My, my business completely changed once I like got dialed in with making sure that every single thing I do in a file, after I do it, I'm generating a, the next task on, on my CRM. Mm. So that way every, like some are auto generated when they move from like stage to stage. But on top of that, it's like when I do something else and I know that I'm going to have to do something two days later, I generate the task, set it for two days later. So then every, every action I do has a, a task that's going to generate afterwards. And then I basically just log into my computer in the morning, see all my tasks for the day, see all my assistance tasks for the day. We sometimes, if she has a lot, we'll have a call in the morning, go over everything together. And then we just like bang them out one after another. And sometimes like I'll burn through the tasks so much faster than if I was just like scrambling to try to remember what I had to do. It's, it's night and day different. And then I can spend that time generating more business or like reaching out to past clients, having conversations with them. And that's going to lead them to refer me more business because they like me more. And, and you said one thing in there that's, you said assistant. And I think that's the answer for most people too. If you don't have whatever that is, you desire the skill set that's like the calendar person or the numbers person or what the marketing side of it. I think someone that is. <laughs> well, I think you just try to find a partner or hire someone that can hopefully compliment you. That's what I've tried to do myself with. We have, um, we have four, we have three client care managers and an operations manager, so we're pretty heavy on the back end for the team because um, everyone's got a very specific yeah. role. So I know my role; it's one thing, and I, I don't do anything that's not like the primary uh, things of the business because it's easy to get sidetracked and, and not be good at stuff, and then let you know yeah. other people are better than me at it. So yeah, okay. So you're you're extremely organized. You're extremely consistent. What have you struggled with? <laughs> well, a lot, no, lots of stuff. Um, I mean, yeah, no, I mean, we struggle with um, all the all the same things that, you know, any growing business does. You know, you manage your expenses and you manage your, your revenue and, and to manage an aggressively growing business, you often are putting a lot of investment into your business, which means that you're spending a lot of money. So when you're making a lot of money, it sounds great. 2021, 121 homes were flying and, and you know, we that's when we first hit... Uh, uh, Number one in Google. That's when we had a lot of big milestones in our marketing. Um, we took on more bus shelters, more bus benches, more TVs, more everything because we were on fire. Yeah. <laughs> and all that stuff had a great return. I mean, absolutely did. I mean, I know the marketing worked, but uh, to be able to be nimble enough to know when to contract and make cuts and just adapt as things go. And then, so I mean, if anything, I was a little slow probably to make a few. Um, uh, necessary cuts. And I mean, the, belt, the business is so healthy. Everything's great. But when you want to be super aggressive, you got to plan for that worst case scenario. And, and um, you know, only the paranoid will survive that type of mentality. Yeah. You have to have it because, yeah. you know, one bad quarter, two bad quarters, three bad quarters, you could be thriving. But if you don't manage your expenses, you could be number one realtor and number one expenses and, and, and lose it all, right? It means yeah. nothing, right? Yeah. So um, that was a little something that you know, it was always a tough lesson as, as we go. I've been there a few times before in 2018 when the stress test came out, that was ugly as well. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's, and then just, uh, and then, you know, growing a team is always a challenge to, to find a, a way to structure a team that makes sense for everyone who's there. So, you know, it's a great exchange of, of value and, and uh, for both sides where the employees yeah. and the people on your team feel respected and valued as they are. And, and also that you feel like you're getting good value and you know, you want people long term. Typically, I mean, I do. I don't, I don't have any one of my team short term. Everyone, um, you know, we have one new one new agent and one new client care manager. But you know, they're going to be long term. And um, you know, I've had people on my team for years. So I think to answer your question, there, it's like I think hiring people, um, finding people, um, and then just trying to be a, a better leader in every sense yeah. of the word. Like, how do you, if you go sell X, Y, Z, how do you make your team, how do you duplicate that so your team can sell X, Y, Z, right? Because if you're not doing that at the end of the day, why does your team want to work mm -hmm. for you? If you're not being 
if they're not gaining any value in terms of leads or business or training or, or opportunity. Right. How do you feel about this statement? Um, the best, the best defense is good offense. That's pretty much how I operate. Yeah. I, yeah. Burn the boats mentality. I mean, that's how I operate, but I, I mean, I operate a little different. I, mean, I have a family. I, I, I don't think play mentality. a little, like a tiny bit of defense, but for the most part, it's all offense. Well, I always have a belief in myself that I, uh, this, because it's, I think that's like the brainwashed Kool-Aid entrepreneur stuff. You just read every book that makes you condition yourself to do anything. All right. Like Tony yeah. Robbins or any of that stuff. So when business goes bad, the instinct is not, let me save $5. Yeah. It's like, I'll go make $5 or whatever that number is. It's more fun. It's more exciting. It's more more opportunity because five might turn into 10, might turn into 20. But if you save five, you just save five, right? right. You can only save so much. You already know where the ceiling is. You know what the one. ceiling is, right? Yeah. So, but but it's also true that when you save money, it's it's like a salary, right? Because you save 500 bucks a month. That's a guarantee. If it's a fixed cost, you just saved yourself six grand every year. So maybe it's 60 grand over your 10 year, whatever. So you can look at it that way too. So it's not exponential like when you hire when you make earn money it could be exponential but I, I i do feel it's satisfying to make some of those chops that i made on the monthly payments <laughs> i feel like i feel like people need to um like if they're gonna take away anything from this it's what you're talking about earlier which was like play play your strengths because you were saying like hiring people and stuff like that get finding sure. people that that have different strengths than you because i know personally that's that's been like a game changer because no one's good at everything so it might as well just find what you're really good at and then get people for what you're not good at. And your business will grow so much faster. So Completely much faster. agree with that statement. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. All right. The big three, where do you see yourself in five years? Five years? Well, uh, well, probably still in real estate. I hope, I hope I'm still in real estate. Um, <laughs> probably just, um, my hope is, is kind of growth in every direction. Um, hopefully adding, adding, uh, to the business. So growing the business, obviously, um, growing it to a level where everyone on the team is, is, is also growing their incomes in a huge way and opportunity is going to trickle down to everybody. So I very much want to see that happen as a team. Um, and then just probably finding a way to have a little bit more flexibility with my time as every realtor says, uh, yeah. I think since the day they get their license, all oh, one day I'll get a little more flexibility, but, uh, that's the truth. I, I definitely want to have that little more freedom back and I don't have to have a lot of time off. I just have to have like some guaranteed time off. And I, I think that there's lots of ways um, with the team to structure that. So that, that'll be the business side of it. And then, and then that would just let me just be so much more present with my family, which would be the main reason I'd want to do any of that, which is the main reason why I have a team and I have a business is to be able to, again, the flexibility you hope to sort of be able to spend more time with your family. So yeah. Yeah. if you could go back to your, like say before you even got into the fitness industry, would you have done anything different or do you, are you really happy with how everything played out? Um, you know, I, I just, uh, I finished going through this a while ago when I was writing something and thinking about all the things and pretty much everything I've done has been sort of like a building block, like from even a young age, like doing sales at the flea market to, um, you know, working in, in sales at the gym to doing door to door sales. I did that for eight months. We actually, same company, Son Zuber, um, uh, worked at randomly. We just found that out, uh, door knocking. I mean, that was random. <laughs> Uh, yeah, everybody at Stonehouse just like worked at the same company. <laughs> I don't know how it worked. Yeah, was, when he was like, a, I guess he was a few years older than me. Yeah. Say, but what, yeah, what company was that? I'm just curious. Uh, it was Sea to Sky Marketing. Oh, it was okay. on the corner of 10, uh, 10, um, right by Guilford uh, Kitty Corner by the Sheraton uh, oh, Hotel. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Shady operation there. Yeah. <laughs> don't care about saying that. It was shady. <laughs> <laughs> I, I after the this, I'll tell you what they had us do. It's not a good operation there. Really? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll stay tuned. I went from that. Rogers Home Phone to World Vision. I'll just and then I'll tell you the rest later. <laughs> okay. Oh my gosh. And then okay, okay, and then uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna dish out a different number three today because I'm pretty sure you answered number three already. What materialistic item is it your dream to have and why? Ooh, materialistic item. Well. Can it be anything material, any of the material be a world? House, watch, car, whatever. Any, anything. Yeah, okay. If it's material, I think, you know, what would be the epitome of something material? Like, I would definitely, you know, go for experience over material. But if I'm picking just materialistic for sure, I think it'd probably be like building our own home. I think building a house. I think that, you know, if you're thinking what's the best, coolest thing you'd want materialistic, what's the milestone achievement that you could buy or build? It, probably be you know as a realtor going into so many custom homes and yeah. acreage properties and and just beautiful homes all day you, you kind of 
you'd think, wow, one day it'd be nice to build. So I know me and the wife have talked about that. <laughs> How crazy of a house did you guys talk about? <laughs> well, I mean, we might have a different, we'd have two different tastes on that. We'd probably have two different tastes on, yeah. on the type of home. She'd be probably fine with a modest home yeah. with a nice backyard. She wants like a barn, like <laughs> a coastal garden. home. Well, she wants animals. Same with my stepson. They would yeah. love to have animals and, and pets. And what do you want? Uh, <laughs> well, I'd be okay if the pets remained in the barn, perhaps. <laughs> perhaps not in the home. Yeah. <laughs> so I think I would probably say we go for a big enough property where we could all have what we want we'd have a basketball court for the little guy we'd have probably okay, probably have sick. a pool yeah we'd have probably yeah. a pool because i always wanted a pool might as yeah, well yeah that's hot sick. tub why is we talking about hot tub gotta have yeah. a hot tub the house would be probably like maybe maybe a sprawling rancher if we have the space or a two-story home yeah okay. i think the less stairs I yeah. go, I run up the stairs all the time now. It's so much work. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I just think, I mean, it's good. It keeps me in shape, I guess. But, you know, it'd be nice to have just two stories. Where would it be? Langley? Ooh, maybe uh, either, Mur maybe Murrayville, actually. That's where I Chris like lives. Murrayville. Oh, yeah. Murrayville's nice. Yeah. I think Murrayville probably, or maybe, yeah, no, probably Murrayville, actually. Yeah. That's what we're thinking. Maybe Fort Langley, but probably Murrayville. Yeah. Yeah. So a sprawling rancher. <laughs> a sprawling rancher. Basketball court pool. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe I'd have a three. Maybe part of it be three stories. I don't know. If, if there's no price. Uh, the price there's is no, no price. There's no it's anything price. you want. I mean, anything. <laughs> wow. This house is going to be huge. Everything you want. Yeah. Every room for everything. Yeah. I mean, that's just my nature. I want the biggest and the best. Yeah. The wine cellar has to be like I, a freaking... I don't even drink that much wine, but we're have the best wine cellar if we're gonna if we're gonna build it. You have to. <laughs> if it's in my fantasy where it just costs like nothing to me, for sure. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Awesome, man. Well, hey, thanks for coming on, and um, I guess you have the floor. What do you say to all the listeners out there, real estate agents who want to make it big and have a sprawling rancher? Oh, a sprawling. Well, if you want a sprawling rancher, just like me. Um, well, yeah, my advice would be to anyone who's, uh, if you're a new agent, get in the business, um, learn everything you can, listen to podcasts like this to learn from people that have been there before and find out what they've done so you can um, you know, find out what they've done and not have to forge your own path. You can learn a lot from the people that have done it before you. Read a lot. I've been doing more reading lately, more podcast watching. Um, you just want to learn if you're a new agent and find out all the things that you guys are talking about, um, you know, on your podcast and talk to agents that have done it. Um, and then number two is, is just be, be consistent at whatever you try. So don't be, don't give up after a short, um, a short three months of trying something. If it's something that might take six months to a year, like if you've just started door knocking and you've done it for a couple weeks or a month, it may take a couple months to get a better script down, get a better technique down, actually get results. Um, so just, yeah, be, be patient, be consistent, find mentors, find people that have done it before you and join a team if you can. That'll be the best thing possible. If you yeah. find a team that's willing to take you on and do all those things I mentioned, um, that would just catapult your success for sure. Definitely. What are you reading right now? I'm reading Principles by Ray Dalio and it's oh, okay. a slow book because it's, I just, I thought it was 400 something pages. It's actually over 500 pages. Yeah. Now I don't know if I count the appendix in that because I feel like after all that reading, I'm not gonna read that part, but it's- Isn't, That's an investing book. book, right? They've got life principles and they've got financial other principles too. So I'm in the life principles part, which is pretty, pretty tried into tried and true uh, sort of principles we'd all agree on and um, family stuff, which is great. But then, yeah, there's a whole whack load of, of um, history about the guy who's basically been an investor since the get go. And with his it's like Blackwater, I think he's was, a Wall Street guy. Yeah, he's yeah, a, he's um, I want to say Blackwater, like a yeah. fund manager. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, fund manager yeah. who was one of the best records out of anyone. Um, you know, who wasn't the scammers that was, people got caught for, uh, What's his face? Ma Madoff, Bernie, Bernie, Bernie Madoff. Yeah. That was a sweet <laughs> Bernie Madoff. That's right. That's yeah. a sweet documentary. Yeah. Did you watch it, Jared? No. You got to watch where, it. Where, where, what's that it's on, on Netflix. It's called, um, Actually, I don't know what they called it, but it's the Bernie Madoff. Okay, it's the biggest, the name. biggest Ponzi scheme in history. He ran it for like forty years. Man. I think I might it have seen insane. it. Honestly, yeah. I feel like I would have seen it. I'll, I'll check it. It was, made me feel like when I watched so The Big Short. It's one of those types of movies. Yeah. Where you're like, what? Yeah, it's insanity, <laughs> dude. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, and a bunch of people died and stuff. Everybody got killed. It was good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, yeah. Thanks a lot for coming on. Really Thank you so much it. for having me. Really appreciate it, guys. Of course. Our pleasure. And if you guys are still watching this, subscribe, comment, like, leave us a rating. We'll see you guys on the next episode. Peace.